talk about local compactness. Um, so we've been talking about compactness. So you've been following the course, yes. so you need to know about compactness, right? Um, so this continues. Um, so I've mentioned about the early Soviet topologists and how they. Um, uh, so during the 19th century, there was a lot of like German, French, Italian uh, looking at uh, topology. Basically, it came out of uh, analysis. And then in, um, as I said, in the 1920s, there started to be a Soviet school of topology and they kind of, um, they were the ones who, who brought in the idea of compactness and this idea of local compactness. So um, what is topology used for? So topology is quite often used the people who study function spaces and stuff like that. And in those sort of situations, there's kind of two kinds of spaces which are really useful. There's lots of theorems about them. And so they are metric spaces and compact Hausdorff spaces. So typically what happens if you're studying something, if you can prove, if you can put a metric on your space, or you can show that your space is compact and Hausdorff, there's lots of theorems about it, and then you can then solve whatever problem you're solving. So the apology put down there. So locally compact um, sort of came out of that, and it's sort of the idea is that um, compact Hausdorff is so useful, is there any way that a subspace some, some um, topological space, can it be put inside a compact Hausdorff space where we can put all the theorems of topology there? And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and this is why we're studying the idea of the local compact. And it, it, it's particularly useful when it's a Hausdorff space, but we're going to define local, locally compact in general. But the main thing is that it's a useful useful idea. So in general, like speaking topology, like trying to stand out the same as the other is doing the mathematics. But in general, in doing topology, just to understand how the speed of mathematics better. Well, it, it is a branch in itself. So people say topology because they're topologists and, and they like topology, but topology is used a lot. So like if you're an analysis and you do stuff in metric spaces, then you need topology. And there's other, if you study differential equations and you're looking at um, possible solution spaces, you need topology. So there's like lots of theorems in ODEs which prove things like, uh, you know, under certain conditions, the solutions, the solution space is going to be like this. And so you can say, oh, we must have periodic, so there, there must exist a periodic solution or, uh, there must exist a solution. So like in, in ODEs, you're really bound up with existence and uniqueness. And topology is kind of one of those branches that gives you lots of um, ideas of how to, to handle problems. So topology is a useful, useful topic. Okay, here's the definition of locally compact. And to my mind, it seems a little strange definition because what is local about this definition? Uh, so in general, a space is locally compact at a point if there is some compact subspace, right, that contains a neighborhood of our point. I know it's kind of, maybe it's kind of local, but it doesn't seem that local to me. It'll get more, when we restrict ourselves to household spaces, we can do better. Okay. And so a space is locally compact at each of its points, then we call the space uh, locally compact. Okay, so all of this to be locally compact means for every point, there's some compact subspace that contains a neighborhood of that point. Okay, so obviously a compact space is automatically local compact, right? Because the compact space is itself. 
Um, the real line is locally compact. And well, because why is that? Well, if you've got any point X, it's going to exist, it's going to lie in some basis element, some open interval, and that's contained within the closed interval. So, so the real line is locally compact. On the other hand, the rationals are not locally compact. Uh, any um, uh, product of the reals, Rn, that is also locally compact. Uh, you just beef up this argument, right? Because if x can be put inside some basis element, Right, well, that can then just be put inside the closure. Um, this space, however, uh, the infinite dimensional real under the product topology is not locally compact. Okay? Because, well, what does a basis element look like there? Oh, no. Well, we try and do the same trick. If we've got a point inside our omega, uh, what does a neighborhood for that looks like? Well, remember it looks like we're only allowed a finite number of non whole real neighborhoods. And then the rest are going to be all R. Okay? That can't be put inside a compact space, right? So, because R is not compact. Um, okay. And in fact, uh, if you've got any simply ordered set X having the least upper bound property, it is locally compact because in that situation, we can do exactly the same thing that we did uh, for R and R to the N. We can put X inside some interval, open interval, and then that's going to be contained within the closed interval, which is going to be compact uh, in the order to follow. Okay, so, so hopefully that gives you some sense of what you mean, you mean by locally compact. But again, I don't quite see what's kind of local about it, but anyway. So here is where, what, where um, locally compact becomes super useful. Um, this is a, so as I said, since compact Hausdorff spaces uh, are useful, we want to know if we have a subspace of that, we want to know when we have a subspace of that, because then we can use the, the theorems of compact Hausdorffness. Um, and so the following theorem says that if you've got a locally compact Hausdorff space, so basically, this theorem says that locally compact Hausdorff space is as good as compact Hausdorff space. Um, that X is locally compact Hausdorff if and only if there exists some Y satisfying the following conditions. X is a subspace of Y. Y minus X is only a single point, and Y is a compact Hausdorff space. So if you think about this is as good as it gets, right? It's, it's only one point of being a good space. <laughs> um, now, if X started out off compact, this would be pretty boring, right? Because all Y would be would be uh, a space X 
and then we've added a point, and that point is going to be an isolated point. And, and we've done nothing. However, if y, if, if x is non-compact, right, then that point that we add has to be a limit point of x. Right? And think about y, right? Because if we put an open cover of so the fact that x is non-compact means that uh, there exists an open cover which doesn't have a finite subcover. Now we add in our extra points and the space becomes compact. And now we look at an open cover of it. It has to have a finite subcover. So, um, uh, so all of a sudden, we've got a finite subcover of Y. So that means the set, the open cover, the open set that contains the extra point P must sort of eat into, uh, into X such that then you've only got a finite number of sets left over for the cover of Y. Okay, so y, y minus X has to be a limit point. And so that means the closure of X is actually Y. What would you answer to R? A point. <laughs> okay. What would the point look like? We get to this, we add a point. Okay, it has to be a limit point. So what it actually is, is S1. So this is, so this is the point at infinity. So we've just added infinity, right? This goes off to minus infinity, this goes off to minus, minus infinity, it goes off to the same point, same. So infinity, both infinity and minus infinity is infinity. So the, the one point compactification, uh, so this is called the one point compactification. Okay. Um, right, what's the one point compactification of the open interval zero one? Well, we put in a point here. So now infinity is here and here. So it's a circle. Right, and so it's a, both the point zero is one. We've, we've, we've um, uh, what do we, we've, we've made equivalent to zero and one. Right? What's the compactification of the half open interval zero? Hmm? You can. The compactification is just zero one. We just add, and that's easy, right? Because that is only this is one point. Because remember, the closure has to equal the whole set. So yeah, so we've taken zero one, we take its closure, but it has we can only put it as one point. So that means zero and one get identified. Then we get a circle. Um, what's the compactification of uh, Zero one union one two. That's complete to zero and two and zero approach to the same point. Right, so zero, one, and two, it's going to be the extra point, and they have to be identified. And so it looks like a wedge of circles. And in fact, if this was three, four, we get the same answer. Just we identify the closed points to one point and we just be identified. So this is also sometimes known as Alexandrov um, compactification. So in, in general, um, you can have compactification, you can have other compactifications as well. All right, so um, let's see. Uh, think of a cylinder. Uh, 
So say you have some results about commercialization of X. Then what can you say about X itself? Like that would help you a lot. Like if you could think about just compactification of X, I just are the baby time somehow saying in some sense. Um what's an example of where compactification is useful? Um so do you remember in calc two half angle formulas? Uh, for like the tree? Yes. Right. Well, where that comes from is you've got R and it comes from the fact that R is the one point compactification of um, uh, the, the circle is a one point compactification of R. So, in here, in the circle, you know, you've got things like sine x, cos sine x is what parameterizes the circle. And so, then, um, so do you know stereographic projection? So, stereographic project projection is so here's the point infinity in North Pole, and then you map the point on the circle to a point in R. So this is some T. Right? And so what Weierstrass said, what showed was that functions on sine and cosine are the same thing as functions in T in this space here through this through this mapping. And so when you did your half angle formulas, remember there were things like I know, uh, dx equals dt on one plus t squared or something like that. It was something like, I can't remember that exactly, but it was something like that. And uh, sine x went to some rational function of t. You know what I'm talking about? Do you remember these half angle substitutions? But anyway, so this is exactly what what uh, this is exactly what happens. You take some rational expression in sine and cosine. So say you wanted to integrate sine x plus cosine x over cosine x minus sine x, for example. By this substitution you substitute it into a rational function in terms of t, and then you can use partial fractions then to solve it, and then you can substitute back. So the reason why this works is because of exactly this topological. Oh, okay. I, I remember Weierstrass theorem, yeah. It's, it's the Weierstrass was the one who did that. Right. But the reason why that all works is there's topological reasons, it's all to do with this one point compactification. So, so it is useful. Useful in a lot of things. Uh, anyway, I was talking about a cylinder, right? Say you've got an infinite cylinder. So there's lots of different ways you can compactify it, right? So one way you can do it is you know, you can do a two point compactification where basically you get infinity up here. You kind of round up and then you've got a sphere, right? Or another way you can do it is you can do the one point compactification, in which case everything gets compacted to a point and you've kind of got like a donut, but there's, there's no hole between it. It's like a a, you've gotten a sphere and you've pinched the North Pole and the South Pole together. Or you can, um, what else can you do? Oh, you can um, kind of associate this side with this side and you can get like a proper torus from that way. So there's lots of different ways you can compactify a cylinder. And it's just useful if you're studying that. Okay. So, so this one point compactification. So this, this is showing that locally compact household spaces are kind of useful.
So let's prove this theorem. Oh, and it's even better, right? So I, I, I said that a locally compact Hausdorff space is only one point away from being compact Hausdorff, but it's unique as well, because if you've got two different um, spaces satisfying this, then there's a homeomorphism from one to the other, such that it's the identity on X. Okay, so it's kind of like a, a universal object, you know, about universal objects. You, you do that, you will have don't you do that in your have you done that in your capstone? You've seen that concept? Well, universal object just means it's kind of unique and given a situation of just one universal object which satisfies that property. So, so this is as really as good as it gets <laughs> for, for something. It's only one point off. And the way that you add that point is in only, a, is, is only one way you can do it. So it's good. Okay, so let's prove uniqueness. Um, well, that's pretty straightforward because say you've got two spaces satisfying these conditions. So we want to define a homeomorphism. Well, we know it has to be identity on X because there's just one point left over, then we're forced to send uh, the, uh, the extra point from one space to the extra point in the other space. So let's call them P and Q. So P is Y minus X and Q is uh, Y prime minus X. Okay, so this is clearly a bijection. You don't have to do anything to prove that, right? Because it's the identity on, on the subspace and then it, we just maps that to that. Okay, so the only thing we have to do is to show that it sends open sets to open sets. And then by symmetry, if we prove that, then we want to show that it sends open sets in Y to open sets in Y prime. And by symmetry, the same argument is going to show that open sets in Y prime go to open sets in Y. Okay, so let's say we have an open set in Y. There's just two cases, right? Either our extra point is in the set or it's not. Well, if the point is not in, in U, then H of U equals U, and that's open in Y prime. So we have to do. So the only thing we have to worry about is what happens if our point of infinity, our extra point is in our open set. Okay. Well then, this is where this is the place where we have to use house dwarfness. Okay. So if we look at the complement of our open set, that's a closed subspace of Y. Hence, it's a compact subspace. That's where we need house dwarfness. Hence, it's a compact subspace of X. Hence, it's a compact subspace of Y prime. Hence, it's a closed subspace of Y prime. So house dwarfness, make compact and closed set. So therefore, H of U equals U is open in Y prime, since the complement is closed in Y prime. That's nice. <laughs> I like this argument where you've got house dwarfness where you split back and forth between closeness and compactness. Okay. So now we've got to worry about constructing this one point compactification. So let's say we're given a locally compact house door uh, space X. How do we construct a um, it's one point compactification? Well, it's not so hard. So we define Y as just X, and then we just add in our single point. And the convention is usually to call it infinity, just like how it, what we do for R. Okay, now we've got to give Y a topology. Well, anything that's open in X, we want it to be open in Y. So we've got to throw those sets in. So we've got to figure out what are the open sets containing our point in infinity. 
Um, well, that's easy. We just let them be in the form y minus c, where c is a compact subspace of x. Okay, now, why is this a topology? So what do we got to do? We've got to show that it's closed under uh, finite intersections and arbitrary unions. And De Morgan's laws get that. So, so we've got two types of sets, right? So in each case, we've got three, like three subcases. Okay, so uh, if you, if U1 and U2 are open in X, then their intersection is open in X, and so therefore it's open in Y. If U1, if U were intersected uh, Y minus C, uh, then that is, uh, and what is that? Um, It's going to equal u uh, intersected x minus c. Right. Because because uh, uh, u is entirely uh, entirely uh, in x, then the, this extra point can be ignored. So we throw away that, we get that. Um, and if we get y minus c1 intersected y minus c2, that's the same thing as y minus the union of c1. By the De Morgan laws. And finite uh, unions of compact sets are going to be uh, compact. So that works. And then the same thing works for arbitrary unions, right? So if we've got arbitrary unions of open sets in X, this, the result is going to be an open set in X. If we've got an uh, an arbitrary union of y minus ci, that's going to equal y minus the intersection of the cis. Well, actually call it c alphas, I guess, because it's an arbitrary. Right, and then the intersection of these compact sets is going to stay compact. And so this is going to be, um, uh, this is going to be open. And what's the last thing we've got to do? We've got to worry about an arbitrary union of open sets in X and the arbitrary union of uh, these kind of sets. And this is going to equal, um, Uh, so this then, right, is going to be just some open set in X. And this is going to be um, uh, just going to equal some Y minus C. Right? Because we're going to have, by the De Morgan's laws, we're going to have some arbitrary intersection of compact sets. So, Again, we're going to have a union of an open set with this, and that's going to be open. Okay. Oh, and we can replace this, of course, by x, because this is entirely in x, so we can, not what, we can ignore the extra point. So this is a topology. What else are we going to worry about? Well, we've got to worry that X is a subspace of Y, i.e. that the subspace topology that we get from this is going to be the same as the topology that we had to begin with on X. 
And the thing that guarantees that is the fact that the topology includes all open sets in X. Um, so, and if we had, Uh, if we had an open set of the first kind and we intersected with X, well, that's just going to be U, right? Because U is an open set of X. And if we had uh, an intersection of X with an open set of the second kind, um, that just equals X minus C. So everything works with the subspaces. Next, why is compact? Uh, I think that should be why. Any open cover of why must must. So now we have it some, let's say we have some open cover of Y. So these are the only candidates that we, we, uh, that we have, right? Now, our extra set infinity is in Y, so it must be covered by an open set. The only open sets that it can be in is one of type B, right? So infinity, so we must have uh, some set of the form Y minus C. But then the rest of it, C is uh, a compact subspace of X. So given any cover, open cover of Y, one of them has to be a set of this. Then if we restrict the open cover of Y to covering this compact set C, it has to have a finite subcover. And so we're left with a finite subcover of this plus that one extra set. So Y is compact. And finally, we have to show that Y is Hausdorff. Right, now, if we've got given two points, if the two points lie in X, then we're done, right? Because X is Hausdorff. So the only thing we have to check is if we're given a point of X in X and that extra point infinity. Okay, so we're good, right? Because we can choose an, a complex set C in X containing neighborhood U of X. That's just the definition of locally compact. Then U is a neighborhood of X and it's disjoint from Y minus C, right? Because U is contained within C. But Y minus C is an open set because C being compact. Y minus C is an open set of part B. So that gives us disjoint neighborhoods of X and T. Okay, so that's kind of nice construction. Finally, we're going to do the if and only if we're going to do the converse uh, uh, direction. So let's say we're given a space satisfying those points one, two, three. Why is X locally count compact and Hausdorff? Well, it's Hausdorff, right? because it's a subspace of a Hausdorff uh, set uh, of a Hausdorff space. And so why is it locally compact? Um, well, we just go reverse of the last thing we did. Given an X in X, we have disjoint neighborhoods of X and infinity because Y is Hausdorff. Um, and then if we look at Y minus V, right, that's going to be a compact subspace of Y, right? Because um, it's closed. 
and it contains you. And so it enhances local contact. Excellent. And so here are, here are some examples then. So as we've already stated, the one point compactification of R is the circle S1. Uh, the one point compactification of R2 is the sphere S2. Um, a special case of that is if we consider C, the complex numbers as R2, so topologically C is the same as R2. In that case, that sphere is called the Riemann sphere. Um, and uh, that C union infinity, um, and that's a that's also called the extended complex plane, and that's a really well studied object in complex analysis and all kinds of areas. Um, in in general, if, if you've got Rn, if you look at its one point com compactification you get the uh, n-dimensional sphere. And this, this, and so it all looks like this. Although sometimes, instead of putting the plane here, quite often the plane is put here. But it doesn't make any difference. Okay, and then you just do stereographic, uh, projection. Right, because this infinity is just going to be uh, the point zero, 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 one in the last place. And then you've got some point in uh, Sn, say, which is going to be uh, uh, x1 to xn. And you just look at the line that joins this point to this point, and you just take its intersection with that plane. And that's going to give you, oh, hang on. Because the n-dimensional sphere sits in n plus one dimensional space. And this base plane here, just n dimensional space. And that gives you a homeomorphism from this um, n dimensional sphere without the point of infinity to Rn. So that's a, that's a quite well studied object. Um, so I mentioned uh, RP2, which is a uh, real projective space. So this is. Did you see when I talked about RP2? So RP2 is the space of lines with the origin in R3. So it's the, the, the space of lines, so, the, so it's a whole, right? And so the easiest way to think of that, that is like if you then intersect those lines with the sphere S2, you then got S2, but the antipodal points are identified. Okay. And uh, if you then look at a Equatorial band about that sphere, you'll get a three of pairs on the street because points are not identified, right? On okay. opposite sides, points are identified. I know they identify on Mobius strip. On, Mobius strip, on, on the Mobius strip, right. So if you've got RP2 and thinking of it as a sphere, if you look at the, the equatorial band like this, this point is identified with that point. And so you, you get a Mobius, Mobius strip. Um, and so doing this, you can kind of see that this RP2 
is actually the one point compactification of kind of this open Mobius strip here. Make that an open strip like that. So it's locally compact. It's one point. So, so we kind of identify all these points and these points uh, get identified. Um, actually, the, the, the proper way to think of this as you think of RP1, right, which is just the set of lines in R2. Right, so the easy way to think of RP1 is as a circle, you then intersect it with these guys. So that again, so you've got a circle and you've identified opposite points. Okay, so you can think of RP1 as a kind of S1 with the uh, points identified. And then you just look at the tautological, do you guys know vector bundles? So a vector bundle is like you've got some topological space and at each point you put a vector space. So the one that you might have heard of is like, you know, like uh, if you've got a manifold, then at each point you've got a vector space, like, like the tangent space. So, uh, so at each point on this on the space, so you, have a you, you space give a vector space. Space or vector space. It's a collection of vector spaces. It's kind of collection of vector spaces parameterized by the points of the space. So for example, for S1, right, the tangent space at this point here is just a straight line. So it's the collection of points in all those tangent spaces. But the fact, but you don't have these things intersecting here, right? Because this point is different from this point. You actually have to put it into R4 or something so that it doesn't self intersect. So it's just a space of points. Uh, so it's parameterized by a point here. So you've got a point and a vector. So this is actually in something in R4. It's just some, it's just some, it's just some object that you study in differential geometry. And so you can have, you can think of the one point compactification of this. It's just something you study in differential geometry. So anyway, I won't say anything more about that. Uh, it gets, uh, it can get very complicated, but it's just to show you that one point compactifications are important. So they're, they're important also in uh, differential geometry. Anyway. So what's local about local compactness? Um, so if you've got a house door space, uh, then a space is locally compact if and only if given a, a point in that space and a neighborhood of a, a neighborhood of a point, then there is a neighborhood of V of that point such that the closure is compact and the closure is contained within that neighborhood. So that's to my mind way of thinking is kind of more local than the, the other thing. Instead of having sort of the, the neighborhood inside the compact set, you should have the compact set inside the neighborhood. Just seem to be more in the nature of what local should mean. Uh, and there's a corollary of that. If you've got a locally compact house or space 
and a subspace of that, um, then if that space is closed or open in X, then A is locally compact. And then finally, we have a corollary which kind of, I think, makes a little bit more sense of it all. A space is homeomorphic to an open site subspace of a compact Hausdorff space if and only if X is a locally compact Hausdorff space. And so, as I, as I emphasized before, since compact Hausdorff spaces are so nice, this is why locally compact spaces are kind of like the next, next best thing. Maybe we've got time to do the first proof. Um, So going in this direction is okay. Uh, it's going in the other direction. So let's say we have a locally compact uh, space X and let U uh, be a neighborhood of that X. Uh, then that should be Y. Let Y be the uh, one point compactification X. And then let's just then consider Y minus U. Um, right, again, this should be Y. Since Y is compact, we can, uh, uh, choose disjoint neighborhoods for X and C. This is a lemma that we did earlier that um, in compact spaces, you can separate out uh, points from closed sets. And now this neighborhood, you look at its closure and Y, and that works right here. So, so U and V then give us right what we've got right here. Um, I think I need to stop because it's a time. <laughs>